your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, again, this started out being a message or a series of messages on the life of Samson. It ended up being something else. Uh, I think what we were looking at there in Judges was that the Philistines had invaded Israel and invaded because of Israel's sin. And um, you'll hear me preach a lot on God's grace, God's mercy, God's tender love for us, the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, I am all about forgiveness, not just God forgiving me, but it's my responsibility to forgive people that I may not want to forgive, to forgive those who have, uh, what does the Bible say, despitefully used me. I've had that happen before. I've had people who were once my friends, now my enemies. And um, when Jesus taught us how to pray, his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. I don't think Jesus ever intended for that prayer to be just something that you recite 20 times and God takes over. It's intended to be a lesson book on how God will move in your life and how God will work in your life. And the phrase in there, forgive us of our sins or forgive us of our debts or forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, the, phrase, the word as, you know what that means. While we are forgiving those who have done us wrong. Now, let me just say this. You can forgive people who don't even ask. And I would say it's probably best to let some things go. Because unforgiveness and bitterness is a very, very heavy load that you cannot carry. Um, and also, too, just because you forgave somebody of something they did, that does not mean that you have to let them move in with you and you become friends and housemates and neighbors. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean fellowship. There are some people that I have to forgive, but I really... The, the way I live and the way I believe and the way I see things, the way I do things may not be how they do them. And so it's best. The Bible gives us many examples. Lot and Abram, uh, John, Mark, and the Apostle Paul. Uh, sometimes you have to separate from one another. You go, is, Jacob and Esau did that. You, you go away, your way and I'll go mine and God will bless you and God will bless me and and we'll see each other. I appreciate what the sister said back there. She said, you're going to see us all in heaven. Amen. And uh, so forgiving people and loving people while we want God to forgive us of our sins. So I preach a lot about forgiveness of sins. But there's also the issue of the commission of those sins. And God still hates sin as much as he ever did. God hates it. God hates it so much that he has eliminated entire cities from off the face of the earth because of one thing and one thing only, sin. Wasn't there politics? wasn't how much money they had. It had nothing to do with it. It was their sin. It wasn't the type of people they were. 
It wasn't the tribe they were from. It wasn't who their great, great, great grandfather was. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with their sin. God still hates our sin. I want to hear God's people say amen. Now, the reason why the Philistines were allowed, even allowed, to go in and rule over the Israelites was because of Israel's sin. The plain reading and plain understanding of Scripture is that God punishes sin, and those who continue to abide in sin, God will take you out of good authority and put you under cruel authority. I can see America heading in that direction right now. Cruel authority. And people are not going to like it. And God's going to say, you can't do nothing about it. I want you to repent. And so when God brings the cruel authority over, it is so that his people will call upon his name, will confess their sins, will be faithful to God again, and God will bless them, and God will send them a Savior, and God will rescue them, and God will bring them out of the hand of their enemies and into God's loving hand. So when you examine each one of these types of devils that I've been pointing out, uh, let me read the text. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? Why, why does he uh, intend to trick us and deceive us so? It is because he wants us in the bounds of sin. The devil hates freedom. He hates liberty. He hates free people. Amen? He does not want you to be free. Uh, the mention of this person who is uh, overdosed on fentanyl. That person is in bondage. They may not recognize it. They may not realize it, but they are in bondage. Something else is telling them what to do and how to live their life and how to treat others. So they are in, they're in worse bondage than some people who are in prison right now. They're in worse bondage. Because when somebody's in prison, at least for some of them, there's the hope that they'll get out. When you're in bondage to the devil, you can rest assured that he is going to fight you tooth and nail to keep you in his bondage. So, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The fight that you are facing it's not against flesh and blood it's not even against your flesh and blood it's against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world we've covered all of those and now against spiritual wickedness in high places two um, two valid definitions for um, that phrase, high places. Uh, the Greek word here, and I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson. I don't even remember the word, but I, re I remember looking it up. And that phrase there is translated as heavenly places in, in other places in the New Testament. So it speaks, number one, of what evil things the devil does, um, we know that there's going to be a war in heaven or is a war in heaven or was a war in heaven, is a war in heaven, will be a war in heaven. We know that that takes place. We know that the devil is trying to conquer and thus take over the throne of God. And I can tell you that in the last several weeks, I have been dealing with that in my life, the devil wanting to take over and conquer where God is in my heart and move him out and put himself in that place. And that is in the throne of my heart. I don't want the devil there. I don't want him around me. I don't want him touching my family. 
But sure enough, there he is. And he's ready for battle. And uh, I have to repent often because sometimes I'm not ready for battle. So it has to do with what the devil does in heavenly places or what evil spirits do uh, as far as that's concerned. But it also has to do, I believe, with what I'm going to show you this morning. Let's pray before we go on. Father, I ask for your grace. I've been asking for it all week. And Father, I pray to your God that you would move in my heart through the preaching of the word. Father, let it be that I'm uh, a pew member. I'm sitting down with the congregation. I'm listening to what the Holy Ghost has to say. And I'm in need, Father, of your word. And Father, I know if I am, then I know, Lord, that there will be others as well. And I know, Father, that there are others who are in desperate need of your help, your guidance, and to keep the devil out of the holy place that you have set apart only for you, and that is the throne of our heart. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless the words of the message. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would lead in this and guide my thoughts and my words so that they bring glory to you, instruction, Father, to those who are awaiting instruction, wisdom to those who need wisdom, learning to those, God, who have never learned before. I pray, dear God, that you would help each and every... Father, I, I pray, God, you would help each and every man in our church, every husband in our church, not, and not only just this local, but, Father, all around the world that are listening right now, the people who are listening in Kenya right now, to the husbands, to the pastors, to the members of parliament, or those who sit and rule in judgment over the people of Samburu and the people of Lodwar. I pray, dear God, that you would open up their ears and their hearts, dear God, to understand that they are targeted in this war. The arrows are all going to be pointing their way. And Father, it's for a reason. I pray, dear God, that you'd give us wisdom this morning and help us, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look up on the screen. Um, you have places around the world that would be defined by the biblical term high places simply because they are up high. Okay? And let me just kind of give you uh, uh, just my, my brief understanding of why always in the Bible they were, they were always worshiping on the high places, they were sacrificing on the high places, they were burning incense on the high places and so on. Why not, why not do it down here on the ground or down in a valley somewhere or on flat ground. It just seemed like they were always doing it up on a high place, up on a mountaintop, or if they didn't have one, they would build one. They would build a high place. And I'll show you what I think that looks like here in a moment. But why would they do that? And it's because the idea that, the, the belief that we are the humans down here on the earth, the gods or a god is up here in the heavens, and so it befalls upon men to elevate themselves. Are you listening to this? Elevate themselves to a place where they would be in heaven, as it were, so that they could connect with a god or the gods, plural. They would often burn incense up there and burn it up there with the assurance that because they are higher than everybody else, and they are in heaven, the first heaven, the atmosphere, the sky, then it would be easier for the gods to smell their incense or to hear their prayers. Or a lot of times they would sacrifice. They would sometimes sacrifice animals. But in many cases, they also wouldn't have a problem with sacrificing human beings. 
up on these high places. And it's the idea that man elevates himself so that God can reach him. That's not how God did it. God didn't say, elevate yourself so I can reach you. I'm going to lower myself so I can reach you. Somebody say amen. Aren't you glad God did it that way? Amen. He didn't say, now if you climb that mountain, if you can get way up to the top of that mountain, then I will meet you there and everything will be fine and dandy and, that, and I'll bless you there. But you must climb this. You must be part of you. You must ascend up. In India, it's called the... Um, Oh, what is it called? The um, Anyway, it's a system of classification of people. The caste system. And usually the darker skin you are in India, the lower the, the caste that you're in. And it's the, the belief that you live your life, and if you don't do a good job living your life, then when you are reincarnated, which is a lie... Reincarnation is a lie. Thank you. It's a lie. For it's appointed unto man once to die. Once. But they believe that multiple births and multiple deaths. So if you didn't live, do such a good job in, your, in one life, when you are come again into another life, reincarnated, then you are put on a low caste. When the British people took over and, and conquered India and made it a colony, they were amazed because there was no, there was no help system for people that were poor. There were, there were almost no hospitals for just anybody to go into. The idea was, is that if you are sick, it's because the gods made you sick and made you live in this lower caste. And so anybody up here could not give aid to anybody down here. It's what they deserve. I'm glad that God saw me, saw me as I was, reached down from heaven, came down from heaven, took me where I was, made me into something I never thought I could be. And didn't say, well, you're too low, I can't touch you. So that is my opinion of the high places. Here we have... We have idols up on top of mountains. That's If you see there on the left, that's the Great Wall of China. There's a big idol standing up there. It's probably Buddha. And then over here, you can recognize these Indian temples they, where they worship 330 million gods. How would you like to pray that prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Shiva, Brahma, Shakti, and start naming 330 million gods. If you go over to Illinois, what is that, Ron? Cahokia Mounds. Art, an artificial hill. Why? Because that area of Illinois is sort of like uh, southern Missouri. It's the Mississippi Plain. It's all been made flat by the Mississippi River, and they didn't have any hills, so they made one. wonder how long it took for them to make this high place. By the way, it's the upper left-hand corner. And as Americans settled into this land, they, they noted all these mounds that the Indians were mound builders. They were building high places. On the lower right hand is called the Serpent Mound. Guess who they worshipped? Satan. Okay, they just didn't know him as Satan. They worshipped the serpent. These are the artificial high places. Isn't it something that everywhere in the world, they all built an identical worship place. Pyramids. Everywhere. These are all Mexico, Central America, South America. That's where you're going to find them. These, of course, are in Egypt. They're all out, all throughout Egypt. Even in China. And the communist government decided they didn't want people knowing there was pyramids there. So they sent people out to plant trees to cover it up. The problem is they planted trees like farmers plant the gardens. They did them all in straight lines. So you can clearly see uh, that doesn't look real. But they were at some time in China's past, they were the artificial high places where people worship, people um, burn incense. They worshiped pagan gods, idols. They took innocent people, slew them on top of that mountain, on top of that pyramid, 
let their blood run down the side of the pyramid. Down in uh, Central and South America or Mexico, at times, the priests were noted for taking the sacrifice, the human, cutting a hole in their chest while they're standing there alive, reaching in and cutting their heart out while they're still, it's still pumping, while they're looking at it. Wicked stuff. Why do you think God hated these high places? Do you think there's spiritual wickedness going on in high places? Say amen. That's what they would do. Or sacrifice children. Now, we of course know the Tower of Babel. And what its purpose was. That um, let's build us a city and a tower whose top may reach where? Into heaven. It was man's ascendancy. Man elevating himself above God. What did, and where did that come from? Lucifer. What did Lucifer say? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, what's the words? The most high. Well, it's a shame when these kids know it and you adults don't. Say amen, kids. Amen. All right. But that's what they were. This uh, on the upper left is the, uh, uh, I can't remember, it's the temple of heaven. The temple of heaven. Notice that they have three rings. They represent the three heavens. And Chinese people were doing this and they had no idea that there really were three heavens. But there's three heavens. Okay. But it's a high place where they did all sorts of evil things. Now, this is in Lodwar, Turkana, Kenya. The Catholic Church has built on a high place a statue. It is not Jesus. Say amen. How do you know it's not Jesus? You have no idea what Jesus looks like. So you cannot make a statue of Jesus because every statue looks different. Every painting looks different. Every artist concept looks different. We have no idea what Jesus looked like. God told the Israelites in the Old Testament, He said, you saw no similitude of me at Mount Sinai. So don't make an idol and say, this is the Lord. Don't do it. By the way, this is the idol shepherd. I-D-O-L. The idol shepherd that the prophet warned about. And it's right by the Lodwar airport. When you fly in, that's the first thing you see getting out of the plane. It's this high spot, and it makes me mad every time I go there. I just... People, there's a set of steps going up to this thing. People will climb those steps in hopes that God will see them laboring and hurting themselves, climbing these steps, get to the top so they can pray in front of the statue. And the hope is that God sees them... Um, laboring and God sees them uh, suffering for their sins and so Christ will accept them and partial payment of their sins. You cannot pay for your own sins. There's only one that could and his name was Jesus. And he told us not to pray to statues. But this is, listen, now let me tell you what this represents. This represents... Evil, it represents the presence of evil spirits that are over this area. Does that make sense to everybody? Where there's idols, there's going to be gods, little g. They are going to be where the gods are worshipped. They have a, listen, I'm telling you, they have a strong hold in this area. John, zoom out and mute all the sound for a minute.
there was a way I could tell each and every one of you and it not get out beyond that, I would do it. But suffice it to say, we are hated over there, even to the point, well, you know what I'm saying. That's how bad we're hated. That's a spirit. That's a spirit that we have to wrestle against. When we go over there, it's a spirit that the people there who are working for us have to deal with. Okay? Now, guess what? St. Peter's Square, built on a hill. Okay? It's called the Vatican Hill. Uh, by the way, right here, I don't know if you can see that, Capitoline Hill, what does that sound like to you? This is Rome, by the way. Capitoline Hill. It's Capitol Hill. They put a temple on a high place. And if you don't believe that, go there or do a Google image search and you're going to find there's a painting up in the Capitol Dome. And um, it has to do with elevating George Washington to the status of a god. The statue, of the, the painting of George Washington is up in that Capitol Dome and it represents him being transformed into a god ruling with the 13, uh, 13 women circling him who are supposed to represent the 13 colonies. But that's all, that's all a ruse. There is, is, do you believe that there is a spirit in this high place here? Absolutely, there's a spirit there's several of them. There's lots of them in this high place. So, I want you to start thinking now. Uh, and it's not just, not just politics, not just religion. This is the corporate world. This is, uh, this is Google, or not Google, uh, Apple's new headquarters. Okay? Built up on a little hill. Uh, looks like, I, I don't know if they intended it for it to look like a flying saucer, but that's what it looks like to me. But anyway, um, that's Apple's headquarters. Do you think that there is a spirit in the higher places of Apple's headquarters? Uh, um, Steve Jobs was a heavy practitioner into Eastern mysticism. He was meditating constantly. I think a lot of the ideas that he got were given to him, were transmitted to him while he is meditating, while he was practicing all these ancient um, Indian or Eastern mystic practices. He was in contact with familiar spirits and he was running what now has become one of the most successful computer companies in the world. Apple products are everywhere now, aren't they? They're in America, they're in China, they're in Kenya. They're all over the place right now. And technology is taking us into a place that I don't want to go with it. Amen to that. What about Wall Street? Do you think that there are spirits there working and achieving wealth and building up wealth for, for the elite, as it were? The elite are getting rich and getting more rich. And that, listen, I'm a capitalist all the way. I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. If you earn the money, it's your right to keep it. Amen. As long as you earn it legally. Amen. But I, I'm 100% capitalist. But these people have a lot of power. There is a, there is a group of, let's say, let's say a thousand people in the world that own the majority of the companies that sell products all around the world. In other words, this world basically is owned by a very elite few people. Seven and a half, almost eight billion people on the planet ruled over by a thousand. And they're not even in government. They just have a lot of money and they have a lot of power. And any place you have that, you're going to have spirits working in those high places. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, oh, by the way, this was a hill. 
Anybody know where this is? Epstein Island. He built, this by the way is the entrance to an underground bunker. Let's talk religion. The leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention have a problem on their hands. They know that they have way too many pedophile, rapist pastors. Do you think there is a problem in the high places of the religious denominations in this world? It's not just the Catholic Church. Let's be honest. It's in the Free Will Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the General Baptist, the American Baptist, the Pentecostal, United Pentecostal, Pentecostal Holiness, Church of God, Pentecostal Church of God. You name the denomination, it's there. But it's also in our homes. Who is the head of the house? Who's the head of the house? The husband. Was that you, Robert? Thank you. Man's got some sense. Not, not, that's Robert, that Robert. You're Robert, right? Okay. I, I, have, I forget names easily. Um, I wanted to call you what I call my son-in-law, Mick. <laughs> you look like Michael sitting there. But anyway, um, the husband's the head. So he's the high place. He's where all the decisions are made. He's the one protecting the family. He is, and believe it or not, devils, and here's what I'm going to get to. Devils know that they have a far better chance attacking the children and the wife when they can get the head out of the way. How was John the Baptist killed? Beheaded. What about those people in the book of Revelation? How did they die? They're beheaded, aren't they? Had their head taken away. And in a spiritual sense, the head of every house is the husband. I know that's not popular nowadays, but that's just what the Bible says. Okay? And this is where I'm going with this message. I'm the husband to Lisa, the father of all of my children, the grandfather of all my grandchildren. And I, I promise you, I've been the target more than once. In ways that I just, I don't even want to talk about. But so is every husband and every father who's hearing my voice right now. In ways that probably you don't want to talk about either. So we won't talk about, well, we will. We're going to talk about them. Uh, turn your Bible to Ezekiel 8. I want to show you something. Uh, this, to me, just, it just nails it. What God's going to do, He's going to take Ezekiel. Now, they are already been into captivity. But there are some who are still living in Jerusalem. And what God's going to do is, He's going to show Ezekiel what's going on behind the scenes. Every, every house, every family has secrets. Every family has skeletons in the closet. And we just don't want everybody knowing everything that goes on behind the curtains, behind the scenes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's not everybody's business to know. It's certainly not a priest's business to know. Amen? So, aren't you glad that you only have to confess your sins to God? Because He already knows. But, we're gonna, God's going to take Ezekiel and He's going to show him the religious and political hierarchy of Israel. He's going to show him behind the scenes what's going on. He's going to take him in places that he never would be able to go. And God's going to show him that the higher he gets, 
in the hierarchy of Israel's religious system and political system, the higher he goes, the worse the transgressions are. And starting in verse 5, Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So they have a, an idol there. And he said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Now, now go back to this picture very quickly of this, um, this, uh, this idol in Lodwar. That is, that indicates spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, that's what can be seen of what's going on in Lodwar town. That's what is seen. But it, that real evil exists in places where normal eyes cannot see. But I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord, that evil exists and it's there. Thus saith the Lord. God is telling, He's opening your eyes by showing you the inner workings of a hierarchy. He's showing you that the higher you get, the more evil it becomes. Amen. Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. So, verse 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about, and there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. So now we're narrowing down a number. Now we got the seventy. The seventy were the seventy men that Moses picked to help judge the people of Israel. It's called the Sanhedrin. They're the ones who judged Christ and had him crucified. It's these 70 men or that group of 70 men that are the elders and the rulers of Israel. They're not only the religious judges, but they are the uh, political judges of Israel. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing. Uh, okay. All right, appreciate that. David, David's watching. He's sending me some notes here. What did he say? He said uh, the building at Apple is called the mothership. Okay, I got you. I, I appreciate that. And he said the, the logo of Apple, it's a bite out of an apple. Genesis 3. Duh. All right, now. Thanks, David. All right, verse 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Boy, they're burning that incense. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou sent... Now, let me, let me stop right here and ask you a question. How many of you, before you pray... Light some incense. It just seems easier that if we need to pray, we just stop and we pray. Amen. Bow your head. Pray. Get out on your knees. Pray. Start weeping and trembling and pray. You don't need incense. Amen. Incense is a religious substitute for prayer. And it represents what men have substituted for godly living, godly prayer, communicating with God, fellowshipping with God. Oh, let's just light some incense now. That'll take care of it for us. Bunch of nonsense. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the, of the house of Israel do in the dark? Look, see, it's in the dark. Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. But God says, I see him, and Ezekiel, now you see him. And now the whole world is going to see him. Because I want to make sure this is printed in every Bible that goes out. Now, verse 15. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. So we started out in the courtyard. There was an image. There's maybe 100 people, 150, 200, 300. Now we get in to a chamber... And now there's 70 men, and God says, oh, guess what? I'm going to show you something worse than this. So verse 16, he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, 
were about five and 20 men. You see, in a hierarchy, it goes, it narrows down in the number, doesn't it? Like a pyramid, like on your dollar bill. And I hate to say, but there is a hierarchy running this country. They control the banks. They control the Department of Justice. They can go after who they want to go after. They can destroy who they want to destroy. We're seeing that right now. Right now. God's opening our eyes to a hierarchy and it, and it gets less and less people when you get toward the top. Five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. Every civilization and culture in the world worship the sun at one time or another. Same thing now. Worshiping the sun. And it's a hierarchy that's doing it. And God said, oh, it's worse than that. So in verse 17, he said, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? Notice this. I have this underlined. For they filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. Now, I want you to stop for a minute. Does the spiritual condition of the mother and the father have any effect on the spiritual condition of their children? Duh. When mom and daddy decide to get right with God, they're going to church and they're taking their kids with them. And you take them and you put them in Sunday school and you make them sit through an hour of church worship like I had to and whoop their backside if they ever bring out a Guinness Book of World Records during church like I did. Amen, mama? Amen. It didn't hurt, but I didn't tell her that. The way here that the elders are going, they have filled the land with violence, haven't they? You know, with Saul, there was a progression. With King Saul, when the, when the Bible says when Samuel first found him, he was a goodly man. Head and shoulders above everybody else. Handsome, tall man. Good, but he was good. And when Samuel anointed him, all of a sudden he starts preaching with the other preachers. And they said, is Saul among the prophets of Israel? He's preaching. But then he rejected the word of the Lord, didn't he? And after that, God quit forgiving him. And so every time Saul saw David, what did he do? Threw a javelin at him. His sin, his willful sin, caused him not only to turn against God, but to turn against everybody who was in favor with God. He turned to violence. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So the higher he got, the worse it got. And the worse it got, God finally said, I'm not going to forgive them. They pushed me too far. They have gone too far, and I'm not going to spare them. So in the next chapter, which we won't read, God sent a man with a writer's ink horn to go out and put a mark on the forehead of everybody who was crying and weeping for the abominations that were taking place in their land, and God spared them, and he had sent those men out to slay every man, woman, and child that was left. Because of their abominations. The children, because the parents had already ruined them. Children aren't born innocent creatures, by the way. They're born sinners. And if a godly mother and father, or a godly mother, will take those children and show them the right way, teach them the gospel, have, have preachers preach to them, Sunday school teachers teaching them Bible verses to memorize. Those children will grow up and hopefully they'll hate sin the way mama hated sin. 
It's how it's supposed to work. So anybody in authority, the spiritual wickedness is going to target you. They're going to target you because of in, when there's authority, there's a blanket or an umbrella of protection of people that are under you. And those people that are under you are safe as long as they remain there. And it's something that as soon as the kids grow up and they get out of the house, what happens? Boom. You know why? They're out of mom and dad's authority. And what has to happen is they have to get themselves grounded under God's authority. Now, because mom and daddy ain't around. Therefore, tell a man, leave his father and mother. Now, Zechariah 13, 7. This, and I was back here in 1997, crying my eyes out, hiding from everybody, because I just felt like leaving. And during my prayer, the Holy Ghost whispered this verse to me, or spoke this verse to me. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And that's when it occurred to me, Mike, you're not the target. Your wife and kids are. I wanted, the devil wants to destroy them. So he's going after you to get you removed out of the way. Does that make sense? So, evil kings equals an evil nation. Second Kings 13, he did that which, and there's, the names of the kings are not here, but with every one of these, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and then it says, which made Israel to sin. Third, Second Kings 13, 11, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. 2 Kings 14, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, who made Israel to sin. 2 Kings 15, 9, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, who made Israel to sin. You see how it works? When the king was evil, he made the people be evil. When the king is righteous, the people want revival. When Hezekiah came on the scene, he, he wanted righteousness. And God blessed that, and he blessed him with a whole nation full of people that wanted to worship the Lord. Josiah, the same way. So, and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Second, First Kings 22, and he walked in all the ways of Asa his father and turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, 2 Kings 12, and, and Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. 2 Kings 14, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Um, 2 Kings 15, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Over and over and over, that's what you see when the king is right. The people are right. Dads, husbands, get grandpas, get your heart right with God. And understand, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Understand what is going to come your way to cause you to stumble and cause you to fall. And there just happens to be a list in your Bible. So you don't say, well, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. I bet you are. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. And this is in, there's 18 things here. And it's in stark contrast to the nine fruits of the Spirit that you see later on in this same chapter. Um, you have the works, verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then down in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I want you to... You're in chapter 5. God just showed me a verse here. Where is it? Ah, verse 9. Everybody look at Galatians 5, verse 9. What does that verse say? Read that for us. How much sin does it take? Just a little bit. 
So how much adultery? You say, well, I, I haven't cheated on my wife. Okay. How much fornication? How much uncleanness? Lasciviousness. All Those are four sins that deal with sexual perversion in that realm. And I have counseled people with this issue, talked to people, tried to help people. It is a very, very common issue nowadays because of the Internet. And it's rampant. And it starts, that's the, the, the issue of pornography generally is what starts, is the leaven that starts a person on the road to committing very vile acts. The leaven of uh, pedophiles is pornography. The leaven of a serial adulterer is pornography. The leaven of homosexuality is pornography. Pornography is the leaven that leavens the whole lump. It all starts there. Generally, when police arrest somebody who has hurt a child that way, they automatically know, get a search warrant for his phone, tablet, computer, hard drives, everything, because they're 99.9% .9 sure of what they're going to find on there. That's just how it works. It is an evil, evil, disastrous thing. And the devils and the spirits that are working in the high places are going to do everything they can to make sure that it destroys the fabric of every home in America. In fact, the fabric of what America is, is the home. Godly home life, a husband, a wife, and children. How many, how many of our families have been destroyed because of this? It's like the, the young man that preached down at camp this past year. He's a school teacher, elementary school teacher. And he said 80% of the students in his class are from broken homes. A home where they're not living with their father and their mother United in a marriage, they are from a broken home of some kind, another. And that's just that's just the start of it. I don't have time to go into all of it. But here, here the, here's the leaven now that gets into people. Idolatry. And there's different kinds of idolatry. Did you know that the New Testament categorizes idolatry as covetousness? And let me tell you, the American economy is based up solely upon covetousness. I want a new this. I want a new that. I want a new home. I want a new car. I want new this. I want all new things. I want more and more of it. And we are the most, probably the most covetous nation that there is. To say that we don't deal with idolatry is wrong because we do. And so that, that's why you think you need $30 an hour, $40 an hour, $50 an hour at your work. Why? Because you want to buy more stuff. You know your neighbor works a job and, and he makes such and such money and you want to make that so you can have what he's got or have something better than what he's got. Idolatry, witchcraft, any kind of false religion, 
false prayer practices, so on. Hatred. Oh, there's a lot of that now. There's a lot of that. Hatred among the races. Hatred among neighbors. Hatred between churches. It's everywhere. Nobody gets along with nobody else in this country. We're full of hatred. Variants. That we're going against the norms that have been laid down by society. We are, we are varying people. Which is why you see, uh, as young people grow into adulthood, here come the tattoos. Here come the piercings. Here comes the orange spray paint in their hair. Anything to show that they are, variate, or are at variance with normal society. Emulations. Oh, I want to be like so-and-so on TV. Oh, I want to be like Mr. Cool J or whoever, rap star or whatever. I don't know rap stars. I just, you know, you're, you're never going to walk in my office and hear me listening to rap. It's not going to happen. Ed Bell. Several years ago, there's a family that came to our church from Ferguson. Right after the Mike Brown incident, I was on a Sunday morning and I asked for just anybody to stand up and give a testimony. And one person said one thing and Ed jumped up. And he's black, his family's black. He's, he said, Pastor Mike, I want you to know that what happened up there was a direct result, number one, of the music that the kids listen to. It, it is very, very antagonistic toward white people and toward police officers. Hatred for white people and hatred for police officers. And he said, it also, it also comes from the family system that they grew up under. And they are told to hate white people and hate cops. And I'm sitting there going, and he lives in Ferguson, still does. And I'm just like, I can't believe he's saying this. What he said was true. And I, I don't have to tell you, and I ain't preached this in a long time, but I don't have to tell you. Oh my goodness, it's almost 12.30. I don't have to tell you, you shouldn't let your kids listen to that garbage. Don't let your kids listen to rap, any other kind of music, top 40, hit. I don't let them listen to that garbage. Don't do it. I want to move on, I want to finish this. Envyings, uh, Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, drunkenness. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, street drugs, prescription drugs, it's drunkenness. Drunkenness, you can also be drunk with fornication. That's the wine that Babylon holds in her cup. It's a wine of fornication, and she makes people drunk with it. The same high that you get from fornication is very similar to the high you would get from alcohol or from any other narcotic drug. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, dads, I'm going to tell you, you, God has placed you as being responsible for how your children turn out in life. God has put you as being responsible for that. Now, I know that you can do your best and when they get old, they, they choose a path and on and on and on. But that is no excuse for you not to teach them. John 3.16 Romans 10, 9 and 10. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 1 John 1, 9. Teach them the, the golden rule. Teach them that to love the Lord their God with all their heart. Teach them to love their neighbor as themselves. Teach them to follow Jesus Christ. Teach them that when they are at their worst to call upon the name of the Lord. 
That is, that is the responsibility, not of the school, not of the church. It is the responsibility of the parents of that house. And so now you understand why the devil marked you and said, I'm going to destroy you. Some of you who are here or listening, you may not have children yet. I'm, I'm telling you, the setup's taking place now. The destruction will come after the kids are born. If you want to follow two examples out of the Bible, then follow this. When Moses was born, was there not an edict from Pharaoh already in place to kill Moses? Only they just didn't know it was Moses. And they didn't know where he was going to be born at and how he was going to get free. But there was already a law in place to kill this one child, Moses. When Jesus was born, there was an edict set in place by Herod. Kill all the children two years old because they knew he couldn't be above two years old. Kill all the children two years old and younger. Destroy them so that this Jesus never has a chance to come up be king of the Jews like I am. And I'm telling you, the setup for your life and the devil destroying you is already in place. He's just waiting for the kid to show up. You're going to have to decide whose side you're going to be on, which side you're going to live on, and whether or not you want God to help you. I understand that a lot of these things are addictions. I know all about addiction. Okay? And I'm telling you, they're hard, they're hard to kick. But there is great joy in getting victory over them. God is the one who's going to give you the victory. God is. No self-help technique. No, nothing that you hear about on the internet. God will. God will in His time.